Amen. Thank you for that. Turn with me this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We didn't quite finish the chapter last week, but I do want to finish the book today. We're going to finish the last couple of verses of chapter 5 and jump into chapter 6. We'll start with a nice, easy, cultural hot topic. Nice and easy. Stuff everyone agrees on. All right, so 1 Timothy 5, we left off at verse 22. We're going to start with verse 23. The Apostle Paul tells young man Timothy here, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. All right, so let's talk about wine. Let's talk about that today, church. Let's look at it. One thing I will say is you can't take a topic from 2,000 years ago, snatch it out of its culture, pop it into your culture word for word, and think that you have the right answer. You've got to look back and understand what was also happening at the time in the culture in the church. Because right now... Wine in 2023, 2024, is a very different thing than wine 2,000 years ago. Science has changed. The additives have changed. Everything about it has changed. I will say, and water. Water in the ancient world was often impure and not safe to drink. The practice was to mingle it with wine, and the slightly alcoholic content of that would make your drinking water safer. Timothy probably had problems from impure water. It also says here he had oft infirmities. The fermentation process would eliminate some of the harmful things in the water and make it uh, a little wine rather than water. He was probably, you know, he was a young preacher. He was probably abstaining from alcohol for the sake of setting a good example, and that's the best example, abstinence. Having this abstinence may have been hurting his health because of the environment that he lived in with the water. And so wine was safer to drink for him. And so Paul told Timothy that it wasn't wise to sacrifice his health for the sake of that abstinence. And he would do good, you know, better for Jesus and his kingdom by taking care of his body. We do have to take care of our health. Now, I will say this. Let's talk a little bit about wine contextually from scriptures, what it is. Turn with me to Genesis 40. Keep a hand here. We'll be back. Genesis 40. This is not a story that seems like it's going to contextually matter, but we learn something from it. That's a practical historical truth. We remember Joseph had been imprisoned and God gave Joseph the power of prophecy dreams. We did not have completed scripture. God used prophets and dreams. In Hebrews, he says, God at sundry times and diverse manners spoke unto the fathers by dreams and prophets, etc. So, we have here Joseph in jail for no reason of his own, for no, no fault of his own. And he has guests in jail with him that Pharaoh has thrown in jail. And they're having dreams that are unsettling to them. And so in verse 9, the chief butler told this dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. Remember that. We'll cross-reference this later with Isaiah. Clusters, ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. So what we have there is wine. We have a cluster of grapes with a servant pressing them into the cup and handing it to Pharaoh and him drinking it and them calling that wine. We see that in Isaiah 65, 8. I won't have you turn to that one. It's just one verse. I'll quote it. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, cluster of grapes, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servant's sake that I may not destroy them. So we see a cluster of grapes in Genesis 4 pressed into a cup. We see Isaiah 65, that cluster of grapes pressed is called new wine. 
And so that was the culture of it in your Old Testament. Now, I did look up an article, a modern article, from a modern Israeli winemaking company. And they have a whole section on the history of wine distilling in Israel. And they talk about old-fashioned processes in biblical times. And this is one of the articles. It says, another question that often arises in regards to wine in the Bible and Christ's consumption is its alcoholic strength. If the wine was in fact wine and not grape juice, because we know new wine here, we saw examples of it being grape juice, then it obviously had to have some sort of alcoholic content. However, the wine of the biblical era was much weaker than the wine we know today. One reason for this was the addition of water. You study through, you see all, all kinds of verses about mingled wine. They always mixed it with water. They cut it on purpose, both to make the water healthier and to make sure that they weren't going to get drunk. And so they said that's one reason. But another reason was naturally fermented wine. Naturally fermented wine does not have additives was the only wine available at the time. Sugar and yeast were not yet added to wine at that time. Its alcoholic content remained much lower than modern day spirits. So what I'm saying by this is it's not the same thing. In 2024, you open up your Bible and you read a wine verse and you think, <laughs> Zinfandel, <laughs> 10%. No, it's not the same thing at all. It's clear that given time, though, we know juices, wines, will ferment and become alcoholic. And that's why when you read scriptures, especially the New Testament, what you've got are warnings. You've got here a little wine. You've got verses about pastors and deacons. Not much wine. The idea isn't, oh, here's my verse. I get to be a social drinker. No, the idea is warnings about it so that you don't get yourself in trouble because wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. Book of Proverbs, whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And so Timothy, Paul is telling him, take some sparingly and medicinally. By the way, folks, if I have a nasty cold, I want NyQuil. Like the, 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 the cold that keeps you up all night, you can't even lay down flat kind of cold and can't sleep and are miserable, I'll take NyQuil. You go, oh, pastor, there's alcoholic content in NyQuil. That's why it works. And so, you know, these same people that say, don't take NyQuil, what I'm going to do when they get their tonsils removed and they're sitting in their hospital bed on morphine drip, I'm going to go in and say, you know, we can unplug this right now. But don't you want to be a man of faith? Right? It's like a double standard, right? And so, <laughs> uh, and I've actually heard guys preach that way. You shouldn't take anything like that. Come on now. God gave us that for medicinal use. I think that's the purpose of the little wine here for Timothy. It's for medicinal use. That's the balanced approach, okay? So when you study the history of it, you look at modern sources, you look at the difference in culture, you start to get a picture of the differences. But I want to tell you why personally... I'm against alcoholic drinking of any kind. First and foremost, as a lost young man, I had a great problem with alcohol. And I believe when God saved me, he saved me from that kind of life. It's also a lifestyle. Uh, but I think it's more about 1 Thessalonians 5.22. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 tells Christians, abstain from all appearance of evil. If this might even look wrong, to others, I probably shouldn't be doing it, is the idea. You couple this with 1 Peter 4. I'll have you turn to that one. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. The end of chapter 3 has Christ seated at the right hand of God as our intercessor. And then we roll into chapter 4 of 1 Peter, and it says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, a mind of I'm willing to serve to the point that I might face persecution. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time 
in the flesh. You can live your life in the flesh. And this is an idea of in the flesh versus in the spirit. Being spiritually led as opposed to being carnally led. The rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. God, is this your will? God, I want to follow your best. For the time past of our life, we all have a past, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in, and so, so this is how the Gentiles, the world lives, the Gentiles live, the pagans, right? They walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Ah, oh, that goody do choos doesn't know how to have a good time. I don't see what's wrong with this. We're all doing it. Why, you know, you just need to relax and do, bleh, right? I don't know that you've ever heard all that. I finished with an eloquent, because we know that that's, like the, sometimes that's the attitude behind it. Don't tell me how to live. Don't bring God into this. There's nothing wrong. Well, you know what? I'm very concerned with what God thinks is right and wrong. And I'm very concerned with what God thinks looks right and looks wrong. And I apply all of that to my Christian walk as I make my choices. And First Peter warns us that it's easy to go along with the way Gentiles do stuff. And their excesses and their banquetings and their riots and their <laughs> parties and... He says, we don't do that anymore because we've got Christ now and we pursue a different path. We're walking unto the Lord. You go out there in that world, you do what the world does. You say, I'm just going to get a glass of wine. And so-and-so walks by and says, there, saw a pastor boozing it up at Applebee's. And, I, you know, and you could go, oh, that wasn't, I was having just one. You know, it's so funny, the, the just one. Why does everyone want me to have just one? Why, don't, why, why does everyone want me? Come on, I'm not saying you should get drunk. I'm saying you could have just one. Why does everyone want me to have just one? There's an old French idiom that says, one is too many and a thousand isn't enough. And that's the heart of man. Why do you need me to do that? Well, I will say this also about Timothy. I don't think you need just one. I think the best testimony is no thank you. I think the best testimony is God saved me and I want to make sure that I am, that my body, a temple of the Holy Spirit, is filled with him and not other spirits. Amen. They call it spirits for a reason. Uh, by the way, you know what you, can't, you couldn't do when you were Timothy? You couldn't stop at 7-Eleven and get a coffee the way you wanted it. You couldn't go to the fridge and pull out an OJ. You couldn't uh, grab milk or a Diet Coke or a smoothie or... You know, so that's why I, I think the 21st century is better. Um, <laughs> couldn't have air conditioning or clean water. So, you know, I just think what we do as Christians should be purposeful and under the Lord. And what we do and what we purposefully abstain from before Ben is important. It's important and means something. And uh, you can't get drunk if you don't drink it. Amen. So I gave up booze for Jesus is a very powerful testimony. And that is my challenge today. I think Timothy was the victim of frequent infirmities, as we see from the, the text. And I will say this, we could think about this from a different point. How come Paul never healed Timothy of his frequent infirmities? Didn't Paul have the ability to do that? Well, we have a couple of things going on. This was near the end of Paul's ministry. The sign gifts of healing were passing away, as were some of the other sign gifts that were meant to prove the New Testament as we moved from the Jew as a nation to the church in the world. Those signs were meant to be confirmations, and we were losing some of these signs now. And Paul did not use powers for whatever reason to heal Timothy. It may be that those gifts were leaving, or it may be that the scripture is saying, you know what, it's okay to take Natural remedies as well. There are some denominations that say, I won't take medicine. I'll just trust God. Well, here we've got Paul saying, I'm not going to heal you. Take a little something medicinally, right? So I think we've got scriptures that show us we can take things medicinally and it's okay. Amen. So it was not God's will, by the way, for everyone to be healed right now. And it had nothing to do with Timothy's faith or lack of faith. There's all kinds of false doctrine about what healing really is. 
None of that had to do with this at all. So he said, go look for a natural remedy and deal with your illnesses through management, wisdom, and God's grace. And sometimes you've just got to study through a matter. I tell you what, nowadays, with all of that allergy stuff coming out, I mean, we live that. We live. The, Joanne is a science project, and she knows I mean that in the best way. And so <laughs> she's called herself that before. It's, we're, not, we're not having family problems, really. And so, but what I mean by that is, like, there are so many allergies. Like, you know, I understand, like, yeah, food is weird now. I mean, and there are things in America we don't put on our labeling that other countries do to warn you about, like, soy. I mean, all this stuff. It's like, it's hard. You've got to learn. You've got to, your, your body becomes a science project if you're sick, right? And so I think this scripture tells you, yeah, do what you need to do medicinally, naturally, to help yourself out. And there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, it's not God's will to heal everybody of everything. Sometimes what we need is God's grace. And so let's look at the rest of the chapter. Uh, I've already spent more time on that than I wanted to today. But we move into this idea of sins versus good works. Some men's sins are obvious. You can see them coming. There's a testimony of them. You know, the word is out, right? Some men, you have no clue. They're living in sin. And you have no idea. But God knows. God knows. And if you're hiding sin today, you're not hiding sin. You might fool people. You're not fooling God. God knows all about it. And he says that will follow. The judgment of that will follow. So rather we should choose good works instead of sin. Filling our time. You can fill your time with sin. You can fill it with good works. And we should do that. And, uh, and, that's another, and by the way, this is all in the context. If we had gone back to last week, we're still following like the, the lay hands suddenly on no man. But prove people, prove elders. And so one of the things that we want to see in people is, you know, prove good works, prove faithfulness. Anyone can do something once or twice, right? You're proved through faithfulness. And if you have a life of good works, ultimately, you'll be known for your good works as a good person under the Lord. So let's do that. Let's say, God in heaven, I want to replace my old man, my old desires, my old carnal stuff. I want to replace that with good works. I want to be faithful to the word of God. I want to be in prayer. I want to help people. I want to go out of my way to take some of my time and do something for others. I want to be known as a, a churchgoer and bless my church. I want to give. I want to fill my life with good works. Amen. So let's look into chapter six. Verse one, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. I want you to notice this. This is actually not just, we use the word servant a lot, right? Like you should be a servant under the Lord and we should all have service mindsets as Christians. But this isn't, he's not talking to people that just want to serve the Lord. He's talking to full on bond servant, Roman empire slaves in the church. Do you understand that under the Roman empire, at the height of their empire, at one point, nearly one third of Italians were slaves to the Roman empire. It's like mind-blowing to think about living in a culture like that. We don't get that in the West. Modern Americans can't conceive verses really anymore about just like that kind of submission. You know, we, we're a people of he can't tell me what to do, or we say that to our parents and to our bosses and to our pastors and to the police. And I'll say this, God takes authority structures very seriously. The Bible says the powers that be are of God and he has ordained them. And if you find yourself under someone in some authority structure, whether it be in the family or at work or at church or in the military, well, you want to take that very seriously as a duty and a responsibility. And he, he's put people in their position and their position is a reality. And he told these slaves... <laughs> Free yourselves! Well, that didn't happen until 1840 years later worldwide. And so, you look at verse 2. They that have believing masters, let them not despise them, 
because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. And now, again, if we try to retroactively apply modern knowledge to Scripture 2,000 years ago, you could be like, oh, that Christian should have freed all of his slaves. That's not the way the world worked. That's brand new. It was a different age. From there, it was, this is the reality. This is the situation. Honor those over you. Pray for them that have the rule over you. Honor those over you and your family. Verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ into the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So he tells these Roman era slaves, serve your masters as unto the Lord, even if they're Christians, because they're also your brothers. And he calls this challenge to serve others wholesome words. We don't try to always be advancing our own opinions and political agendas and get our platform and make ourselves and our thing the issue if we don't have the authority to do it. Every now and again, and that's one of the reasons I liked, I liked that my kids did a little bit of volleyball and a little bit of basketball. They were on a team and they had a coach and they learned, yes, sir. A little bit of that's good. You gotta learn, you've gotta learn in this life a little bit of yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Or you're not going to go very far. You'll find yourself out of yet another job. <laughs> but uh, this is doubled in Ephesians 6. I won't have you turn there today, but it's pretty much the same words Paul preaches to the Ephesians in chapter 6. But he then warns about wholesome words and consenting to wholesome words. And what he's teaching now, they're scripture, but they should be commonsensical, wholesome words that make sense to people that have a spirit of understanding. And he says, we should agree to these. And if, and then he calls them wholesome words and he says, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he calls this doctrine. Doctrine is truth that is lived. And he says, if you will not live according to this, your problem, verse four, is pride. And the proud know nothing at all. They make themselves the issue. And the end of their communication is strife and envy and evil surmisings. I bet that person's doing A, B, and C. I bet they're even... You like how eloquent I get sometimes? A little bit of blah. A little bit of blah, blah, blah. Well, I think we all know what I mean. All right. So, <laughs> but we live in a day where people are replacing the plain teaching of the word of God, even in churches, where they focus on experiential worship, prophecies, visions, spiritual experience. And they're no longer consenting to wholesome words in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a great danger Paul warned Timothy of 2,000 years ago. And it's true in our churches, there's a lot of false doctrine in churches, folks. There just is. So you want to find a Bible-based, words of the Lord Jesus-based church and cling to it and support it. Amen. So not only that, but really, I think, just beware people that always want to argue. I bet if I say that person just always wants to argue and they always have an issue with everything I say or the way I say it. Well, you know what? It's okay, the Bible says, to withdraw yourself from such people because there's something about that spirit where you know there's a fight looming and the Lord doesn't want us striving. He wants us to live in peace. And so it's okay to let something pass by, really, even when you know it's not quite right. Christian, every now and again, you can just let something pass. In baseball, 
A lot of guys, they let the first pitch go by. Am I right, Jonathan? Why? You want to see what's going on. You want to see what's up with the pitcher. This might not be your swing. This might not be your ball. Every, you got at least a couple more coming. So maybe you let one go by unto the Lord for peace sake. And that's okay. You don't have to fight. You don't have to swing hard at every pitch, right? It's okay to something. I'm not going to try to set every person straight about everything. I could. I see plenty wrong. But I, I just, you know, I just don't want to be that person. I'm not the sheriff of everyone's lives. There is a time to challenge an ungodly, untrue doctrine or line of thinking. And it is easy sometimes for Christians to always be silent and kind of become a compromiser. The key is spiritually to find the right balance and make sure that this isn't just about you being angry about something, <laughs> but that you're taking up the Lord's cause in a matter, right? Pick your battles. We have the Proverbs that tell us to answer not a, cool, uh, a fool according to his folly, lest thou become like unto him. Sometimes arguing with a fool just makes you look foolish. But then it also says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. What's the, what's the difference? One, well, is this going to make me look like a fool? Am I just going to get in a fight? Or can I actually help this person? There's the difference. So much pride. Here, 2,000 years ago, not much has changed. Paul warns against this. And then we move on to, believe it or not, the prosperity gospel prophesied right here in Scripture. And it's not a good thing. Verse 5 says, there are people that suppose that gain equals godliness. If you don't have a BMW, you're not blessed. God isn't really blessing you. You don't really have faith. You're not really walking the walk. From such withdraw thyself, because godliness with contentment is great gain. Gain is God. This is the prosperity gospel. We have churches, mega churches, filled with prosperity gospel preachers. And you know what? They have what they're preaching. They've got the jets and the mansions and multi-millions. There's way too many of them to even name. I could drop a dozen names right now. And they're the ones that get the TV time and the air time and the books on the shelves. You know what? It's not good. And you say, well, why are they filled with people? Because a lot of people want that. They don't want a suffering faith. They don't want a sacrificial faith. They want a faith that pays them. And that's not a true thing. That's not a, so personal success and happiness and a stronger family and a more secure life, aren't these things that we want? Sure. And on a spiritual level, these are things you'll find in Christ. I mean, if you really surrender to Christ and try to walk his path and encourage your family to do so, and they all get in on that purpose for your family and life, you're going to have the, the best family life you've ever had. But it's not a transactional thing where, you know, okay, I said the word of faith. Give me my fill in the blank. Marketing. The gospel is a product now that will fix the need of every life. When the gospel is marketed, it creates followers of Jesus who are unprepared for tough times. Because when I read my Bible, I see a Jesus that didn't have a place to lay his head. I see a Jesus that said, persecution is coming. Persecution. That's a word you don't hear in prosperity gospel churches. Many of their hearts set on the blessings they can get instead of the one who is the source blessing. And again, it turns into a stuff religion. Timothy is told to separate himself from the prosperity gospel preachers. And folks, we need to do the same. We don't need their stuff. We don't need their books. We don't need their bands. We don't need their, their, their entertainment halls. They can take their money and their music and their marketing. I'll take Jesus. Real simple. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, the real thing that we sang in our hymn this morning. Now, contentment, godliness with, godliness with contentment is great gain. And there's a spiritual contentment that can only be found connected to the pursuit of godliness. 
See, we want contentment without the work of godliness. This is difficult. We can only find contentment when our hearts are rooted and grounded in the right spiritual source, in eternal things. And contentment is essential because it shows we're living with an eternal perspective instead of a right now perspective. We're not just trying to feather an earthly nest. We're looking beyond that. We're looking to eternity. And it's, it's hard to be content in this culture because we live in a consumer culture that is built on feeding lack of contentment. <laughs> that, that's the culture we live in. Everything is geared towards, yeah, what did I see? I, I was watching some YouTube video the other day and of course you got ads and I hate ads. So some guy has to come on and say, let me tell you how you can make 7,000 a month without having to learn anything new and without having to put up your own money and without, yeah, so I, that, and that's the, that's the, the hook, right? How you can be uber rich without having to do anything. <laughs> without having to change your life. Just buy my book. Watch my video. Just subscribe and you'll, everything will be okay. You understand what's going on here? You're being played, friends. And what they're doing is they're feeding that little piece of you. I would like 7,000 extra a month without having to work more than 10 hours a week from my laptop computer. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? That's not real. There might be a couple of people at the top of the pyramid that arrange that, and that's what they are. They're pyramid Ponzi scams where, you know, you've got one block on top and a million blocks underneath. And so don't be someone else's stepping stone, right? But there's more than that. It's, it's the heart of it. They know what people want. What people want is ease and riches and contentment. We almost always desire far more than we need. What is it we really need? What is it we really need? Godliness with contentment is great gain. It, godliness can bring a peace that passes understanding and a contentment that most people don't really have. But before it can, we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, Romans 12. We've got to start putting material things in their proper priority way beneath spiritual things. Physical priorities need to be below spiritual priorities for this to work. If it's always the physical priority first, then the godliness and the contentment will be lacking. It'll be missing. That sense of I'm missing something happens. Verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world that is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, in other words, they that desire riches, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For money is, no, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. That mindset, heart, and desire is off track from the faith and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Have you ever had something stuck in your hand that you couldn't get out? Man, that one, once when I was a kid, I stepped hard on a long tack. And I got that thing centered in my heel. And I could not pull that thing out. You know, you touch it, you're like, ah! You try to even touch it, and it hurts. And then you try to put a little pressure on it, and you can't do it yourself. I needed someone else to intervene and pull it out for me. I got myself in the mess. I needed an external force to get me out. And you know that what that is in a nutshell, folks, that's salvation. That's salvation, right? The truth about Jesus is this, okay? We have the good news. We have the gospel. The word gospel is another word for good news. The good news is Jesus came to save us, right? But why do we even need saving? You'll have some people that'll say that. I don't need saving. Here's the thing. The angel came and said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their what? Sins. From their sins, right? So good news is connected to the fact, the truth, the ground level bad news is that we all have sin. 
And we can't save ourselves from our sin. We need an external force to save us from our sin. We can't do it ourselves. We try, you know, you try to build a certain framework of our own self-righteousness. And the Bible calls that tattered clothes. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You cannot be good enough to be right with God. You can't do it. No matter how hard you try, you needed Jesus. The truth is you can't save yourself, but you need saving. The truth is Jesus came to do just that. Jesus came, the son of God. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. He's coming again. You have to repent of your sin yourself and just put your faith and trust in what he's done for you. And you come to him, you call on him as your Lord and savior, and then you are born again into the family of God. It's a faith encounter with the Lord Jesus where you need to make the choice and make the call. And then he saves you. Amen. Amen. And that's salvation in Jesus Christ. And by the way, then, it's, then there's a lot of times where we start to talk about sanctification. We start to lay on you. Listen, you need to desire this. You need to want that. You need to add this good work. You need to fight this sin. And that's all true. But you still can't do that, even your walk without Jesus. And so there's a relationship we develop with him that fuels our spiritual efforts. And sometimes we get stuck. We'll get stuck in the world. The only way out is to repent of that worldliness and come to Jesus very simply and say, I want to walk a spiritual life. I want to walk a spiritual life and I want to fight the flesh and the world and not be what they tell me to be. And so that's a... That's an encounter that only you can have with the Lord, but you need to have that. And then we have scriptures here with, with the challenge, the back and forth life, right? Look at this, verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, the prosperity gospel, the desire for riches, all that worldly stuff. Flee these things and follow after righteousness. So it's not just quit doing stuff. We don't have a just quit doing stuff religion. We have a there's a better way religion. Instead of following after all that, you follow after the Lord. You follow righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. You recognize that you're in a fight. If you don't recognize you're in a fight, you're going to get knocked out. That's what's going to happen. If you don't recognize the confrontation and what's going on spiritually in you and around you, and if you just coast and say, I'll be fine, you're not going to see it coming. You're going to get knocked out spiritually and find yourself in a very wrong place in life. So you've got to determine, recognize it for what it is. This is a spiritual battle I'm in, and I'm going to go to war spiritually, and I'm determined to follow Jesus and his righteousness and see that as my calling and lay hold. And this is what it means, by the way, to lay hold or grasp eternal life, to really grasp eternal life right now in our mortal frames is to commit to this great spiritual battle. That's how you lay hold on eternal life. That's how you tap in to the eternal divine stuff that God wants you to have through this mindset. Let this mind be in you the Bible says, which was also in Christ Jesus, who in the form of God thought of not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself a servant. The mindset of the battle of faith. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that thou keep thyself, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Boy, you start to get excited. I start to get like goosebumps. When I start to read these verses, when he starts to roll into the truth of who Jesus really is, we have a world full of, you know, self-important people, billionaires, kings, presidents. He's the most powerful person in the world. He's the richest man in the world. He's the most famous this or that. And he's like, none of them are anything. 
Let's talk about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who dwells in eternal light that no man, you can't touch the Lord. Amen. And he's who you can draw close to through faith. And with all these charges, he's charging Timothy to preach this way. So when you hear me preaching this way from Scripture, I'm just following the charge that the Apostle Paul gave to Timothy. And then he's going to charge, the, he's going to charge Paul to charge the rich. Let's look at verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good. So this is how you enjoy your riches. Another yacht. No. Verse 18 is how to enjoy your riches. You do good with them. That they do good. That they be rich in good works. Ready to distribute. That means give it away. <laughs> Willing to communicate. Laying up in store for themselves a 30-year plan. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just, I'm making this up as I go. No, it's a good foundation against the, kind, the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. We have that idea doubled in this chapter about laying hold on eternal ideas. And to lay hold on eternal life, you've got to give. You've got to sacrifice. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. So we have this charge to the rich. Now I could go this route and say, you know, every single person here makes 98% more than the rest of the people of the world. And that would be true. But I understand that technically true. But I understand we also live in a society where certain amounts of money are required to do certain things. And I believe Christians should shoot poor professionalism. I believe you shouldn't be satisfied with a, a minimum wage job. You should be thankful for one and take one to start, but that you should also want to improve yourself. I had a Christian man I was talking to the other night and he, said, he talked about how all of a sudden he had a wife and kids and he was working a real simple low paying job and he just started to look at his future. Young people don't often do this. They don't look at their future. And he said, if I want A, B, and C, I need to level up. <laughs> and he said, he, told, he had this conversation with himself. I need to level up. And like young people, level up. I mean it. Like if you look at a household income right now, it's ridiculous. You have no idea what the numbers have been doing. Inflation and numbers. The household median in Westbrook right now is $81,000. Now, I understand we live in a culture where usually you've got a full-time mom and a full-time dad. But I think if we want Christianity to go forward the way it went forward in the Bible, and if we want to try to have parents who are able to spend more time at home with their kids, and mothers want to obviously be maybe part-time workers and helping so that they can be there for their children more instead of just giving the children to the world, schools and daycares. I understand sometimes you have to do some of this, okay? But what I'm saying is if the goal is I want to be the parent of my children and the median income of the city is this, and you're a man and you're thinking I'd like this kind of family, you're going to need to level up. You're going to need to make more than half that. You're going to need to make the majority of that. So what does that mean? That means trades and degrees, the right kind of degrees that actually have maybe a hard science degree, maybe something that gets you into a corporation, something like that. And you can do all of that unto the Lord. You really can. You can do all that saying, God, I want to be a provider for my family and I want to be able to give uh, to, to the church and give unto the Lord. And, I, and, I, and so that's my reason for seeking this. And God will really bless that. I believe that. But if it, and so you've got to have the right kind of mindset and you've got to look ahead and you've got to be ready. And people here that are rich, they, they want to have the mindset of laying hold on eternal life by giving, by giving and sacrificing, taking our responsibilities seriously, not losing sight of the charges God gives his people. Children of God, your father has expectations for you, and that's okay. We should want to know what those expectations are, 
and fulfill them to the very best of our ability. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed, please.